All right. Welcome, everybody, to Katy Community Church. We appreciate you being here. Hope you had a great week last week. Let's begin, as we always do, with a word of prayer, which gives us each the opportunity to examine ourselves, make sure we're in fellowship with God by using the rebound technique if necessary, which is based on 1 John 1, 9, which says, if we will confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us for, for our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and your love for us. We thank you for watching over us and taking care of us. We pray for Corey as he is having his MRI on Tuesday. Uh, you'll watch over that whole situation and the, the uh, result will be a positive one. There was nothing there. And uh, that's what we are praying for, for, Heavenly Father. We know that your will will be done. Be with us today as we continue our study on the power of thought. Help us with our understanding. Help us with our application to our individual lives so that we may continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right. We are continuing the verses that we started in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Let me read them again to you in chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. It says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage battle according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying arguments and all arrogance raised against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So staying with our passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we must ask ourselves, what are these fortresses that Satan has and how can they be destroyed? We have seen the weapons of our warfare. We've studied those from uh, Ephesians chapter 6. We've seen the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, and so on. So these weapons are spiritual weapons designed by God to destroy the strongholds of Satan, the influence of his demon army, and the world system in which he controls, in which we live. So it's Satan's desire, as we well know, to distract us, to deceive us, and ultimately to destroy us as believers. That's what he wants to do. And he does it by attacking the way that you think. The Greek word here for arguments, because it says, for though we walk in the flesh, we don't wage battle according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We've seen that aspect of how we are to think and what equipment we have to think with. Now let's talk about how we destroy these fortresses, how we destroy these arguments and the arrogance that's raised against God's knowledge, the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God being what? Bible doctrine. So the Greek word for arguments means thoughts. The Greek word for arrogance means everything high or exalted as in, in human pride. Pride is both a mental attitude sin and a human viewpoint system of thought. And Satan uses human viewpoint and false doctrine to keep us off balance and off track spiritually. The Greek word for raised against us means to elevate. So what's happening here? What is Paul referring to? These arguments, these thoughts 
and arrogance, this pride, are raised against Bible doctrine, which is resident in our souls as believers if we're advancing in the spiritual life. If you're not advancing in the spiritual life, Satan's already won the battle in your life, right? He's got you exactly where he wants you. You're not living your spiritual life. You're not glorifying Jesus Christ. You're not, ultimately, not a, a major part of the resolution of the angelic conflict. So these arguments and arrogance are against doctrine that you have in your soul. The meaning of the Greek word confirms the fact that we are in a battle for the control of how we think. And we've said this over and over again throughout the years and we'll continue to do so that the Christian way of life is a life of thinking. The Bible makes it very clear. There's only two viewpoints for us as believers, either human viewpoint or divine viewpoint. And choosing the right viewpoint will determine what a believer's life will be like, because even if you're a believer in Christ, does not mean that you are going to think divine viewpoint. You cannot think divine viewpoint if you don't know what the divine viewpoint of life is. And there's only one source of knowing that information, and that is the Word of God. Therefore, if you know nothing about God's Word, you have no divine viewpoint, even if you know Christ as your Savior. All you know is, I'm going to heaven when I die, and that's it. And that's a sad way for a person to live. They're missing out on so much of life that they could have and enjoy and be happy and avoid all the pitfalls of living in Satan's world system, and yet they choose not to do that. And remember, it is a choice. So the Greek words here give us insight as to what's going on. Thoughts, human pride, arrogance, lifted up against, elevated against Bible doctrine that's in your soul. So choosing the right viewpoint is tantamount to living your spiritual life based on the application of Bible doctrine. Remember, if you have doctrine in your soul and you don't apply it, it does you absolutely no good. So choosing the right viewpoint will determine what a believer's life will be like. It will also determine whether a believer glorifies God or plays into Satan's hand and plays into his world system, which wants to distract you, deceive you, and destroy you. So the question is whether we will use our volition to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So how do we accomplish this seemingly impossible task? So when you think about it, you mean I have to take captive every thought that I have? Yes, that's exactly what I mean. That means that when a thought comes into your mind, you have to evaluate that thought. And if you're living your spiritual life and you are storing doctrine in your soul and you are applying that doctrine to your thought life, then when those thoughts come into your mind, whatever they may be, either divine viewpoint or human viewpoint, you'll know immediately which one they are. If you're doing, if you're doing this, if you're living your spiritual life, if you're applying the doctrine in your soul, if you're learning doctrine and applying doctrine consistently and persistently. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6, and we are ready to punish, I love the way Paul puts this, we're ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. What in the world does he mean by this? Well, let's look at it. The Greek word for punish, first of all, means revenge. Revenge connotes punishment and indicates that all these revolts in the mind of a believer 
where they are revolting against accurate Bible doctrine must be put down immediately. What is Satan doing? He is trying to influence your thinking in a negative way. That's human viewpoint. And human viewpoint is what we are to discard from our thinking. And instead, we are to embrace or accept divine viewpoint. Where do you find divine viewpoint? In the word of God. So this Greek word here for disobedience means refusal to hear. All disobedience, there's a difference between hearing and listening, by the way, in my opinion. Uh, the Greek word for disobedience, refusal not to listen, but to hear. All disobedience connotes deviation from obedience, deviation from authority by failing to listen to and obey the truth. So Satan has many clever systems for controlling our minds, our souls as believers. But God has provided a security system to protect the soul. We see this first in the Garden of Eden. We always go back to that because that's where it all began. And we see the subtlety and the deceit that Satan can bring into the mind of a believer. And he did it with Eve. And Adam followed suit. He deceived her. Adam wasn't deceived, but she was deceived. So he's clever. He knows how we think. He's been observing us from the moment the first human being ever was created. He cannot read your mind. He's not omniscient. He's not omnipotent. He's not all powerful. But he is a genius. And he knows how to manipulate things around you in your life to keep you off track on the way and in the way that you think. So Satan has the clever systems, but God in his grace has given to us a security system to protect our souls. That system is what? What do you Bible doctrine, exactly. One of our two power options. Paul goes on to say, we're ready. We're ready to do what? We're ready to punish all disobedience. Well, that phrase, we are ready, is actually a military term denoting security and could be translated to garrison troops at a certain point to prevent revolution. When you reject Bible doctrine and begin to live your life apart from Bible doctrine, you are living your life for the most part based on how you feel. You have no truth from the word of God as a believer. So it's just about how you feel about things. How do I feel about what's going on around me? How can I solve my problem? What do I need to do to make sure that uh, this doesn't happen to me or whatever the case may be in your life? Instead, God has given us doctrine to problem solve and keep us from living our lives in a state of emotional revolt. And that's what this is emotional revolt. So the verse is warning against revolution in your soul. And how can the believer have revolution in his soul or her soul? When he or she goes negative toward Bible doctrine through emotional revolt, which leads to reversionism, which is based on human viewpoint 
and is apostasy, causing scar tissue eventually on the soul, or what the Bible calls hardness of heart. When this happens, that believer's soul is in a state of revolution. They're revolting against thinking the thoughts of Christ, which is Bible doctrine. And I looked up that word revolution in the dictionary. And one of the meanings of it, surprisingly to me, was that it says change in the way of thinking. That's in a secular dictionary. <laughs> so revolting against God and his word is exactly what we're talking about. Emotional revolt to the soul may be temporary carnality where you're just out of fellowship for a moment or it can last a long time uh, until actually, you rebound. Go ahead. I actually found that definition of revolution really interesting because in this case, it's referring to, like in the case of this lesson, it's referring to the change of a single person's way of thinking. But I assume that secular definition can also refer to an entire group changing their way of thinking. Absolutely. I mean, think of the fallen angels. Think of their changing their way of thinking. There was a revolt. That was what it was, and that put that definition as well. Everywhere in the Christian life, even the angelic conflict, it's all about changes in thinking. That's correct. I don't know if y'all heard everything that Max said, but he said the great analogy is, I'm paraphrasing what he said, the, the great analogy is the angelic conflict, the, uh, the revolt of the angels and uh, their in the eternity past, they revolted because of their thinking. This is what Satan did. I will. That was a decision uh, he thought about. He thought about himself in what kind of way? Arrogance, right? Just like we've been talking about here. He became arrogant. He became full of self-pride. Human, not human pride, angelic pride. <laughs> which is a thing apparently, and revolted against God in his thinking. So you're right, Max, it, it's in, if you did look up the definition and I read all of them, it does uh, refer to a group of people or a nation for that matter. Or anything of the industrial revolution. Yeah, it's or even the, yeah, it's a change. Or industrial change revolution, yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. right. So the point is that when emotion takes over, it causes irrational behavior and unhappiness because as we know, our emotions are like a roller coaster, up one minute and down the next. The person who is controlled by their emotion is happy when things are going their way, but unhappy or even depressed when things aren't going their way. That's emotion, up and down. Therefore, we need to guard our souls against satanic attacks because that's what he wants us to do. He wants us to be unstable and living your life based on how you feel about things, about, uh, based on your emotions, is unstable. Just like I said, one minute you're happy, the next minute things aren't going your way and you're unhappy. As a believer in Jesus Christ, whether things are going well for you or whether things are not, not going well for you, should not affect your happiness whatsoever. Because if you are an advancing believer, you are sharing God's happiness. And ha God's happiness is constant. It's unchanging, just like God is. Therefore, if you are applying doctrine, you are applying the happiness of God to your life and not basing your happiness on someone else or something else. You're basing it on your relationship with God. So as a believer, your soul is not automatically protected from the influence of Satan's world system. 
Just because you know Christ is your Savior does not mean that you are going to live your spiritual life and glorify God. You must allow the Holy Spirit to assist you in arming yourself against the attacks of Satan and his world system. And this can be done as you use your volition, your free will, to make positive decisions regarding your relationship with God. You and you alone are the only one can live your spiritual life. No one can live it for you. Therefore, you and you alone are the only one who knows what your spiritual life is like. And you and you alone are the only one who can take control of your spiritual life and use your positive volition to make the right decision to learn the word of God and to apply the word of God on a consistent basis. Your decision after salvation should have been to start learning the word of God, but most of us don't have that opportunity, unfortunately. But it's still our decision. It's still our volition, whether we will grow spiritually and reach spiritual maturity or whether we're going to stay a babe in Christ all of our lives. So your decision after salvation should have been to start learning the word of God since it's, your one, it's one of your two power options in the Christian life. However, however, it's never too late to begin a life of faithfulness to God and to his word. I don't care how old you are or how long you've known Christ as your savior. It does not matter. If you're listening to me and you have not been living your spiritual life because you don't know how to live your spiritual life, we have all the resources for you at Katy Community Church. They're online. There's five or 600 lessons online. There's 270 YouTube videos now that are available to all of us as believers. So it's never too late. Doesn't matter when you start as long as you start. That's the point. Learning how to use the equipment of God is what we're talking about. The equipment that he has provided for us to win spiritual battles. That's the key to overcoming the deceitfulness of Satan and his demons and his world system. Because it's all about what you think. And if you don't have any doctrine in your soul, in your mind, in your frame of reference, then you will not be able to defeat him. He will get you exactly where he wants you and keep you from ever moving forward one step in the Christian life. This all involves learning how to think. And use doctrine as an offensive, not a defensive weapon, but an offensive weapon. Here's what it says in 1 Timothy 4, verses 15 through 16. Take heed unto yourself. What does that mean? Examine. Right? Examine yourself. Examine the way you think. Examine what your Christian life is like. Do I have an ongoing, growing relationship with God? Take heed to yourself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing so, this will both deliver yourself from satanic doctrine and deliver those whom you have influence over. You think you're part of God's plan? I think you are. You're his representatives. What does representatives do? They represent. The trick, trick question, yeah. Yeah, they represent the one who sent them. Who sent us? God sent us. He sent us here to come to know his, his uh, son as our savior which we've done, after that, we are sent here 
as ambassadors for Christ. So Bible doctrine in our souls will first protect us against the wiles, the attacks of, the, of Satan, but it will also be an influence in the life of other people. That's what doctrine does. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 7, it says, you are looking at things. Paul's writing this to the Corinthian church. You're looking at things as, as though they were outwardly. Like this is some kind of battle on the battlefield. You're looking around you at the outward appearance of things. If anyone is confident in himself that he is Christ, have him consider this again within himself, that just as he is Christ, so too are we. What's Paul mean? What's he talking about? Although no demon can enter your body as a believer, greater is he that's in you than he's in the world. You are indwelt by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Satan cannot indwell you. A demon cannot indwell you, cannot be demon-possessed as a believer in Christ. But what you can be possessed with is satanic doctrine, false doctrine. Satanic doctrine can infiltrate your soul if you let it. One of the great dangers that believers face in the Christian life is to assume they know something when they know nothing or very little. There are a lot of Christians out there that have a superficial knowledge, that's what I call it, a superficial knowledge of the Word of God. And that often leads to misinterpretation and misapplication of the Bible. You have to know the Word of God accurately in order to be able to use it properly. When this occurs, when this misapplication occurs, this misinterpretation occurs, what it does is it leaves a vacuum in the soul of that believer that can be filled with false doctrine or inaccurate doctrine. And as this false doctrine infiltrates the soul, human viewpoint takes over as the standard of thinking and living. And they're trying to problem solve and glorify God and live their spiritual life based on something other than accurate Bible doctrine, which is human viewpoint. Being politically correct and so forth. This mindset is, as the scripture says, looking at things as they are outwardly. In contrast, to human viewpoint thinking, believers who have equipped themselves with the armor of God that we studied have a mindset of divine viewpoint, not human viewpoint. Human viewpoint is looking at things outwardly. Divine viewpoints are looking at things inwardly. That's the difference. If anyone is confident in himself that he is Christ, that's a first-class condition, meaning they are confident that they belong to Christ. Have them consider this again within themselves means use the power of thought from their soul to think divine viewpoint. Consider that you are Christ. You belong to Christ. Your thinking is to be according to his thinking. Paul says, just as he is Christ, that believer, so are we too. We're, we're believers too. Paul, he was reminding these believers that he's a believer like them, and he has spiritual authority as an apostle and taught them accurately the word of God and how to think the word of God, use the word of God. Paul wasn't teaching some erroneous doctrine that was contrary to the teachings of Christ, even though that's what they were, some of, of these Judaizers were uh, actually accusing him of doing, but quite the opposite. 
Paul had been given the ministry of teaching the ministry doctrine to, to the church during the church age, which requires believers to have a positive mental attitude toward learning it and applying it. So we have to examine ourselves and think, and what kind of attitude do I have toward God and his word? Isaiah 26, 3, the steadfast mind you will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you, trust in the Lord forever, for in God the Lord, we have an everlasting rock. The question is, is our mind steadfast? Steadfast means stable. Do we have stability of mind? Or are we wishy-washy? Thinking this thing one moment, this thing. Human viewpoint this second, divine viewpoint this second, back to human viewpoint, back to divine viewpoint, back. That's no way to live as a believer. A believer will never advance one step towards spiritual maturity until they have a stabilized, steadfast mind. The opposite of perfect peace is spiritual turmoil. And that's what a believer has if they're not thinking, divine viewpoint. It's always turmoil. Always trying to solve your own problems and you never can solve them. That's why we call it self-induced misery. Paul warned against this in Ephesians 4.14. He says, as a result, and what he had been talking about previously was growing in Christ. As a result of growing up in Christ, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of people, false teachers, false doctrine, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. That word tossed is a nautical term. It's used for a ship out of control at the mercy of, of the wind and the waves. It refers to succumbing to false teachings of Satan's world system of human viewpoint thinking or falling prey to the teachings of a false teacher. I like to say it this way, you know, there are a lot of Christians out there that are no more doctrinally sound than the last preacher they heard. They have no system of learning accurately the word of God. They listen to this person, they listen to that person, this person, that person, another person, and they hear all kinds of different doctrines. Some may be correct, but most of them are incorrect. They are false. And they get so mixed up in their minds that they can never utilize what they've heard and it never gets converted into epinosis doctrine. And as you know, epinosis doctrine is the doctrine that is usable. Gnosis doctrine, which is just academic knowledge, is not usable for a believer. That information that you learn must be converted by God the Holy Spirit into full knowledge, spiritual knowledge, and it has to be accurate. You don't think the Holy Spirit is going to allow a person who has listened to false doctrine and that has become a gnosis doctrine, right? Academic knowledge. You don't think he's going to convert that into spiritual knowledge, do you? Of course not. The only thing that he converts into, into spiritual knowledge is accurate teaching of the word of God. And so this word tossed to and fro means that a person is, is being uh, deceived by Satan into believing something that's false and saying that it's true. It sounds good. It sounds spiritual. I They even quote a verse, right? To deceive you, Holly. One thing that I've noticed is very prevalent is exactly that is um, 
daily devotional books mm -hmm. or apps where there's a verse taken out of context and then a little paragraph about it. Right. And they're so often just completely wrong. Yeah. She was, or they don't say much of anything, mm -hmm. really. Right. Know? Yeah, Holly, you're referring to these daily devotionals. Sometimes they quote a verse, but the verse is out of context, has no really doctrinal meaning, and that happens a lot. So you have to be careful. You have to have your People antennas think up. Being spiritual by yeah. Daily yeah. It, it may sound spiritual, but yeah. you have to know doctrine. You have to be discerning. So this word being tossed around. Is talking about errors in doctrine, false doctrine. Both of these errors lead to carnality and eventually into uh, to reversionism. Satan's world system wants to keep you from ever learning the word of God accurately. So this is illustrated by the words carried about. It means to lift up and be carried around like you're on the top of a, your ship and you're up on the wave and the wave's going the way it wants to go and you have no rudder control. You're going to go where that wave goes. So this is very dangerous. It's also illustrated throughout this passage that Paul used by being deceived. This what the whole passage of Ephesians 4 beginning in verse 12 and following is talking about is about being deceived. So we have to be aware. Paul was warning them not to be carried away with some system of false doctrine. False doctrine is called doctrine of demons in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. It is the doctrine that enters the vacuum in the soul of negative believers. Vacuum is translated as vanity or futility from the Greek word mateotes, meaning emptiness. There's an emptiness there, and it must be filled with something. And what is filled with, if you're listening to someone who's teaching the word of God falsely, satanic doctrine. This warning is further illustrated by Paul in Ephesians 4 in the phrases trickery of men and craftiness in deceitful scheming. The word for trickery means gambling with dice. This is an interesting illustration that Paul used. The Greek word for craftiness means to cheat. So what do we have? The reversionistic believer is playing dice with the devil and the devil has loaded the dice with false doctrine. The devil cheats those members of the royal family who neglect and or reject Bible doctrine. Neglect of Bible doctrine in inevitably results in being outsmarted by the devil because he's the one who loads the dice in favor of false doctrine. You know what? I'm assuming everybody knows what loaded dice are. They're dice that when you roll them, they roll the same number every time. So if you're betting, which is what they do when they roll dice, and you bet on, well, I'm betting 500 bucks that those dice roll a, a six. But the house has already loaded them against you. And they'll never roll what you say. They're going to roll the same number every time. That's what Satan does. He loads the dice against you. Deceitful scheming illustrates the character and treachery of Satan and his ministers of righteousness. These ministers of Satan are ministers of false doctrine. They're in the pulpit of churches every week, even as we speak. The Greek word for deceitful means to lead one into error or seduce. So Satan uses both trickery and craftiness, it's what he did with Eve, remember, to lead the unsuspecting, spiritually immature believer into false doctrine. 
We're not talking about unbelievers here. Unbelievers are deceived by Satan into believing a false gospel message. But now, once they believe in Christ, Satan continues to deceive and wants to get believers to believe false doctrine. The believer is in the royal family of God. They're believers. They're going to heaven, but they have no spiritual life because you cannot live your spiritual life apart from knowing and applying accurate Bible doctrine. In that condition, there's no hope for these believers if they are being deceived by Satan to ever advance one step in the Christian life or be effective in coping with the trials of life, which we all are going to have. Therefore, accurate Bible doctrine is to be our very highest priority as believers. And without it, we will likely believe false doctrine. And you might say, well, I don't believe false doctrine. Oh, really? Oh, really? Check yourself. Are you sure? How do you know if it's false or if it's true? There's only one way, and that's to compare it with the Word of God. Does that line up with what the Word of God teaches? So we always must be discerning as believers in Jesus Christ. And if you've been attending Haiti Community Church for a period of time, you have a lot of accurate doctrine in your soul and should be able to discern when you hear false doctrine. The way that I like to think of it is if you have a book with no contradictions and the doctrine you have contradicts that book, it's not the right doctrine. <laughs> great, great illustration, Max. Max said if you have a book that has no contradictions and the doctrine you have contradicts and, it. And the doctrine that you have or that you hear contradicts that book. And the book's right and the doctrine's false. So and that's what we have. We have the word of God. So Paul compares a spiritually immature believer to a ship out of control, floundering around in a storm. And that's where a lot of believers are, unfortunately. A spiritually immature believer is also compared to a person in that crooked dice game, playing with loaded dice. This means that no matter how smart these believers think they are or how much they think they know, they cannot stand up against the influence of demon doctrine, satanic doctrine, that Satan makes appear as accurate Bible doctrine from God. Satan is the greatest counterfeit to uh, the Christian way of life that there is. He knows how to deceive people. The power of thought is the key to defeating Satan's attempts to fool us, to distract us, and to deceive us. So this is the key. What do you think? How do you think? Are you thinking based on your knowledge and your relationship with God and his word? Or are you just trying to think the way that Satan's world system thinks? If you are, you're going to have a miserable life as a believer. Hopefully, you have trusted Christ as your Savior. You know him as your Savior. You know you have eternal life because he is your Savior. And you are living your spiritual life because of what he did for you as your Savior. But if you don't know Christ as your Savior, then let me just simply tell you that God loves you exactly the way you are. He does not ask you to change your lifestyle, your behavior, or any other factor in your life other than this. Here's the one thing that you must change your mind about, 
and that's about Jesus Christ. That's what the word repentance means in scripture. It doesn't mean to be sorry for your sins. It doesn't mean to turn your life around by your own power and wit and ingenuity. Repent means to change your mind, the way you think. Quit thinking that you can work your way to heaven. Or quit thinking that I'll never get to heaven. Because you can get to heaven. Because Jesus Christ died on the cross and made the payment for your sin. So that you could have eternal life. Your sins have been paid for. Sin's not the issue. Your lifestyle's not the issue. What you do or don't do is not the issue in salvation. What you believe is the issue. Do you believe that Christ died for you on the cross? If you believe that, God says you have eternal life. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. It's just that simple. People try to make it complicated. Religion makes it complicated because they're influenced in a negative way by Satan and his world system. But God's word makes it very clear. And as Max very clearly stated, if you find a book without contradictions and that does not contradict what the word of God says because over 150 times in the New Testament alone, the Bible says that salvation is by faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. And when you accept that, you're accepting a gift from God. For by grace are we saved. That's salvation. That's what the Bible says. For by grace are we saved through faith and that not of ourselves. It's a gift from God, not of works. You can't work for your salvation. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. But God gives you a gift, and you can accept that gift, and you can do that by faith, by believing what Christ did for you on the cross. That's good news. That's the good news of the gospel. If you've never done that, do it right now. It's a good time to do it while you're listening to me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for how you've given us all the tools necessary, how you've given us discernment, wisdom from your word so that we can discern false messages and the trickery and the deceit that Satan and his world system try to put upon us to influence us in a negative way, to deceive us, to destroy us, to distract us from living our spiritual lives. We pray that you will help us with our thinking and the way that we utilize what we know from your word on a daily basis to problem solve and to represent our Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask this in his name. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dr.